of notes for you. <laughs> or lots of scripture references, that's the way I should say it. So we're looking at the subject of what to lean on. And we're, you know, we're talking about these little troubles. Oftentimes we lean on something that we like to rely on, which is our own arms, our own strength. So uh, let's pray and we'll get into the message this morning. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for visiting us. Thank you, Lord, that you are making us unashamed and unafraid to share you. So, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning and show us what to lean on, who to lean on, and what the benefit of that is. Speak to us, Lord, in powerful ways this morning, we ask, and all who agree, say amen. So, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verses 15 through 18, you'll notice we start with the Phillips translation says, we wish you could see how all this is working out for your benefit. And he's talking about things that come against us, as we know. And how the more grace God gives, the more thanksgiving will redound or rebound to his glory. This is the reason why we never collapse. Aren't you glad the Bible says you never collapse? We get beat down sometimes, but we don't collapse, all right? <laughs> hey, the reason why we never, this is the reason why we never collapse. Because why? Because God keeps giving us more grace. See? Just about the time you think you're going hit, to hit the ground, you know that a supply of grace is coming to you. Amen? Just about the time you feel like, you, I just can't take it anymore. Right? Can you turn me down a little bit? I'm, I'm a little loud, huh? Okay. So, just about the time we think, I just cannot take it anymore, then grace is coming. Amen? Amen. So, you know, and we need to learn. In, in those kind of times, you know, when we feel that way, we need to go, we need to say this. Say, it's good to say things over yourself. You all know that, right? Yes. Say, Lord, I know more grace is coming. Because I can't make it anymore without it, right? <laughs> Is that what you're And that's okay. It's okay to admit you can't make it by yourself. It's okay to say that. There's one of the things that, that you know, in, in the place that I went to school in, in, in that particular camp, uh, one of the things they tend to, um, those folks tend to do is they tend to uh, require people to pull themselves up by their bootstrap kind of thing. And sometimes that'll work, but if it's in the flesh, it never does. Amen. I mean, not that you can't work something out eventually, but I'd rather let God do it. How about you? Amen. So this is the reason why we never collapse. The outward man does indeed suffer wear and tear, but, the, but every day the inward man receives fresh strength. Say, I have fresh strength. These little troubles, <laughs> I love the way this version puts it, these little troubles, which are really so transitory. You know, when, when you put so in front of something, you, you know, it's, it's to get attention, right? So transitory, like so nothing, right? These are so transitory are winning for us a permanent, glorious, and solid reward out of all proportion to our pain. <laughs> so the pain's worth it. Now I know some of you are thinking, no, it isn't. <laughs> yes, it is. So the pain is worth it. Say, the pain is worth it. For we are looking all the time, not at the visible things, but the invisible. Aha! There's a clue. If you're stuck looking at the visible thing instead of looking at the invisible thing, in other words, the thing that you cannot see with your natural eye, you can see it with your inward man, you can see it with your heart, you, can, you understand, you know that help is on your way, that heaven is sending a rescue crew after you, right? 
because you're looking at that, not at what's in front of you. The visible things are transitory. It is the invisible things that are really permanent. You know, everything we can see here is going to burn up one day. Isn't that right? That's what the Bible says, that, that the heavens and the earth are going to collapse under, under a fervent heat. In other words, it's, it's going to be like a gigantic atomic, uh, atomic explosion, something that you can't even imagine. And everything is just going to get wiped out, and God's going to recreate everything. Everything, think about that. Everything you see is going to be gone. So why do we worry about it so much? I know, because we live here. Okay, but, but do we need to? So the, the apostle calls trials or troubles little troubles because they are temporary. So when trouble is headed your way, and we usually know when it is, whether we create it or not, we usually know when trouble's headed our way. We get surprised every once in a while, but most of the time we know, okay? When trouble's headed our way, we need to know who to lean on. And, and, and let me say this, to lean on Jesus doesn't just mean, well, I believe he's out there somewhere. <laughs> he's, you know, he's, he's sitting... He's sitting, and in, in, in we need to take comfort in the fact that he is sitting on the throne. That means that his authority is working. That's why he's sitting there. You understand that? Because he's sitting on the throne that is for him. That means his authority is working. And then when we call upon the name of Jesus, that authority works for us. Okay, so we need to take the comfort in that, take comfort in that. But we need to also understand that he's not just sitting there being the king or something, you know, being the boss, whatever we think that may be. He's paying attention. The Bible says that he lives making ever uh, intercession for us. That means speaking on our behalf forevermore. That means he's paying attention to you. He's, he sees it when you are being, being crushed. He sees it when things are coming at you. He sees it when... When, you know, either the enemy camp or just some knucklehead is trying to cause trouble for you. He sees it, he knows about it, and he's acting on your behalf. Because he is obligated to supply grace to us. Woohoo! You want grace to be, slide, to, uh, be supplied to you, right? Because, yes. you know, grace is God's supply. It also means God's favor upon you when you don't deserve it. Yeah, because well, well, sometimes we make the mess, right? Yeah. No, some of you are like, not me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you got that out of out of the book of you a liar. <laughs> so we we become acquainted with him through his word, but we become intimate with him through fellowship. This is something that the guys have problems with. Guys don't like to be intimate. Women aren't really good at it either. They just think they are. You know, they're more likely to hug, but that doesn't mean they're going to let you know. Amen. So, so we become intimate. And if you notice that you don't get much action from the other person until you're intimate with them? In other words, like, I'm the kind of person that counts friends on my hand. One, two, three, four, five, you know. Because to me, that word means something. If I'm going to call you friend, now I don't, I, I, I don't think, well, oh, the pastor doesn't like me. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay. But, but I, it's a very important thing to me. It means that you are acquainted with me well enough to be intimate with me. In other words, you're not afraid to tell me what's going on with you, and I'm not afraid to tell you what's going on with me. See, that's what I'm saying. Women will hug each other, but they're not going to tell. Okay? Now, guys may not prone to hug or tell. <laughs> okay? But you understand what I'm saying? Until we have that until we have that reciprocity, there's a word that you don't hear every day, until we, have, until we have that exchange, not much goes on. You know, you, you, you can live next door to somebody for years, and you get in trouble and go knock on their door and say, well, you help me, they're going to be like, 
I don't even know you. Well, I've been living next door to you for 20 years, you know. And, and because I've been your neighbor, I've been over there all that time for the last 20 years. You ought to come over and help me. And they're like, <laughs> no. Where have you been for the last 20 years then? You want to be friends all of a sudden? <laughs> That's the way we treat God a lot. We want to run around doing whatever we want to do, and then when we get ourselves in a mess, we go, God, you're supposed to be my friend. He's like, really? <laughs> when was the last time you visited me? Hello. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about church attendance. I mean, that's part of it. That's part of it. That's part of it. Okay. But, you know, do you get up in the morning and say, hey, hey, Father, I'm awake now. He knows that. But, you know, understand? You understand what I'm saying? You have some kind of relationship going on, or do you kind of ignore him until something gets going in the middle of the day? Treat your wife like that and see how long that relationship lasts. <laughs> She's say, who are you? Get out of my house. <laughs> All right. Are we learning something? So the apostle said he wished we could see how trouble works to our benefit. Because it does, if we act in faith when it comes, okay? So the reason why he said that is because God will show us the way to overcome our little troubles every time. Every time. Say every time. So uh, Proverbs chapter 3, and, and we're going to look at a couple of scriptures in Proverbs, and uh, we're going to be in Proverbs 3 for the remainder of this mostly, but we do have a little bit in Romans says, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, you have the notes there, says, trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. <laughs> well, I think. People all the time trying to tell me what they think. And, and this is what happens, you know. And I, I know that you, that you, those of you that have been around for a while, you know what my response to that is. What does the Bible say? People say, well, I think. I say, that's fine. What does the Bible say? Huh? That's usually the response I get. <laughs> okay, what does the Bible say? Sometimes people will dig into the memory banks. That mean, you know, and they're struggling because why? Because they're not practicing it. Amen? Do not rely upon your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you. You notice it says heart, not head? Where's the opinion come from? Up here, up in the gray matter, right? Opinions come from the gray matter. Well, I'm supposed to use my brain. Don't rely on it, Don't rely on it too much. It ain't that reliable. Amen? <laughs> Especially when it's something you don't know how to fix anyway. If, if you knew how to fix it anyway, you wouldn't be having the trouble. Amen? So re with all your heart, rely on him to guide you. Now, this is something we don't really like doing. Relying on our heart for him to guide us. We want to rely upon our brain for his, for his guidance to come. Well, you need to say something to me. Well, you, you know, our example of faith is, is Abraham, right? Abraham's living over there in, in modern-day Iraq over there by the Euphrates River, and he's probably a farmer. We don't know that for sure, but he probably was. It, we, we know at least he had animals, okay? And, and, and he's just over there kind of, you know, being a good believer. How do you know he was a good believer? Because God doesn't talk very much to unbelievers. Hello? Okay, so, so he's over there, you know, but more or less kind of minding his own business and then God says to him one day get up and leave your family and go to a country that I shall show you uh, God can I have a map right that's what the that's what the gray matter does the brain uh, why do you want me to leave my family behind? I like my family. You know, me and my cousins, we all get together and we have a good time. And, you know, I don't want... And, and then, you know, remember he brought Lot and that, all that did was give him trouble? 
Remember? So, so what's the thing here? Trust, on, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he will guide you. He will lead you in every decision you make. Woo-wee. Would you like to be able to say that God has guided you in every decision you've made? <laughs> would you like to? I didn't say you do. I said, would you like to? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Because then, because you know, if he guides you, it's right. This is going to work. You know, when we come up with things, we're not, <clears throat> so even sometimes when we're convinced it's going to work, does it? Usually, but not always, right? Okay, well, I've done it this way before. And then God says, I want you to try something different. And you're like, I don't know. I put the cookies in the oven. I bake them at 350 degrees. 350 degrees for 15 minutes and then they come out perfect. That's how we think. Okay? He will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do. Would you have to say that Abraham was intimate with God? Yes. Or he wouldn't have ever left. He would have said like, where? Across the desert? Oh, no, man. And going over there where them people are always throwing their babies in the fires, I'm not going over to that land. Because that's what they were doing over there. The Philistines. Terrible. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, when God speaks to you and tells you to go into that, go and talk, go into that place or go, go to some place and you know that they're in, there's probably maybe nobody in there that's friendly with God. And he says, I want you to go in there anyway. And you go, ah. Right? When, when I pastored in Bullhead, I had a lot of people in the church that worked in the casinos. And, and invariably, not every single one of them, but most of them would come to me sooner or later and say, is it okay for me to work in a, conce- in a casino? I, before I even went to pastor the church there, I, I asked somebody else, is it okay for, you know, I mean, dear God, to work in a casino? Doesn't it need to be light and darkness? One of the people that attended our church was a casino boss. And his, it was his job to go around and extract money from people, not forcefully. <laughs> okay? But, you know, give them free rooms and, and stuff like that. And, and, you know, because as long as they're sitting there, the money's passing out. Right? Okay? But I noticed this. Now, I, I, ne- I never had him come and tell me that one of the customers had given their life to the Lord. But he was all the time leading people that worked in there to the Lord. Awesome. Okay. Become in, intimate with him in whatever you do, and he will lead you wherever you go. Don't think for a moment that you know it all. Because <laughs> we know we don't. For wisdom comes when you adore him with undivided devotion and avoid everything that's wrong. Now that last part sounds hard to do. If you're busy falling in falling around and loving on God, you're not too interested in what's wrong. Hello? It just doesn't have any attraction to you. So, so direction comes through being intimate with him, and trouble comes from not being so intimate. Amen? <laughs> okay. So if, if we are in trouble or we get in trouble, don't look to your flesh or your intellect to get you out. Trust him. You say, well, that trust thing, you know, I know. I, I'm just like you. I had to learn how to trust. You know, when God first t- started telling me to do things, I was like, you want me to do what? I'm not doing that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know, like, and here's the other thing, too. You know, we always know more than we do, right? In other words, we know something's written in the Bible, and we know that there's an obligation to do that thing, but we don't necessarily want to, right? You know, especially if you read James. I mean, he just lays it down on you, man. Pastor James, the book of James. He just lays things, you know, what good are you? You walk around, you see your brother that has, has need, and you, and you say, be warmed and blessed and walk on by. He says, your faith ain't no good. 
He's basically calling you a heathen. <laughs> okay? So we, so we need to learn this intimate thing, right? We need to learn how to get that direction, get that guidance. Because this, this, he said, it's, it has, listen to the context. If you see your brother, in other words, if God draws your attention, okay? Because you can find people that have need almost anywhere you look, right? Do you need to help everybody? No, you ain't got that much money, right? Then you don't have that much time. You just, you can't. But if God draws your attention and then you say be warmed and filled, you're making a mistake. Amen. So, Romans chapter 6 says this. Now the mind of the flesh, which is, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Let's read that again. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit is death. So, what is your gray matter? Is it flesh? Sure is, because it quits working as soon as it hits the ground, right? Okay, so, so your gray matter, the things that you have stored up in that thing, <laughs> whatever sense comes out of it without the help of the Holy Spirit, because he'll work in cooperation with you, okay? That doesn't mean you ignore your mind altogether just when it contradicts what God wants you to do. When God says, I want you to do this, and your brain goes, I don't want to do that, then what do you do? You yield to the Holy Spirit, not to your flesh, okay? Because if you yield to it, it produces death. Death that compromises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and, here, and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace. The reason why I use the Amplified is because I want you to see some particular things here. Soul peace. Because you don't need peace in your spirit. You need peace in your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. What gets you stirred up? Your soul. What brings you down, gets you depressed? Your soul, not your spirit. There is no depression in your spirit. Your spirit has been recreated, and it's connected to the Holy Spirit. Has God got any, does, you know, can you imagine God sitting on the throne? You know, Jesus, today is just a bad day. I don't know what I'm going to do with all them people on, down there on the earth. I mean, look at even half the church is not paying any attention to me. I just don't feel good about all this. We'd be like, no, right? <laughs> so there's nothing, we don't get any of that from him. So, but the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. That is because the mind of the flesh with its carnal thoughts and purposes. You know what carnal is? Junior will like this one. You know what carny is? Carny, meat, flesh. Okay, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile to God. Wow. So in other words, when God tells you to do something and you make a, form an opinion against it, you're doing something hostile to God. Wow. That's the opposite of being intimate, right? Being hostile. When you put your fist in somebody else's face, are you being intimate? No. You're close to them, but you're not being intimate. <laughs> you're trying to be, you're being hostile, you're being violent, right? Ooh, a lot of violence arises out of the soul. Yes. But listen, your flesh will do whatever your soul decides. Got that? Your flesh, your, your soul is your mind your will, and your emotions. Your flesh has a voice, but it will do whatever your soul decides. We don't always do what the Spirit wants us to do. Not always, right? Because sometimes God says, I want you to do this, and we're like, eh, no, we don't want to, for whatever reason, okay? But you, here's the thing, because we, we tend to say, well, you know, it, it's, we, we try, to, try to blame it on something. 
or my flesh? No, your soul. If your soul don't want to, you're not going to. Whether it comes from the spirit side or the flesh side. If your soul don't want to, it ain't going to do it. See? Okay. We learning something? That is because the mind of the flesh with its carnal thoughts and purposes is hostile to God, for it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Wow. So then, those who are living the life of the flesh, catering to the appetites and impulses of their carnal nature, cannot please or satisfy God or be acceptable to him. Romans 12, 2 talked about renewing of the mind. And, and if you read it in, in some of the older translations, it lends to the idea that you have to do something. I mean, you, and you don't just do nothing, don't get me wrong, but it lends more to the idea of, you know, kind of the bootstrap thing. I'll pick myself up kind of thing. It's uh, the renewing of the mind. Let me read it. Let, let me find it and read it for you. Because, because <laughs> we need to see this. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That kind of sounds like you're doing it, right? Do you transform anything? Hello? Do you transform anything? No. You don't have the ability to transform anything in and of yourself, not as a natural being, right? As a natural human being, can you transform anything? No. As a spiritual being, can you transform something? Yes. Right? For example, when we lay, when we lay hands on the sick and they are healed, they are transformed from sickness to health, right? Okay. So it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. Where's the transformation coming from? Your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. If you have no intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you know, nothing's going to transform. And he's always working on our behalf. Uh, you know, that, that, uh, that song, Just As I Am, I, I, I grew up in a church, they sang that almost every service at the end. <laughs> At the end of the service, you know, try to get somebody up to the altar. Just as I am without one plea. And I would grab that pew in front of me for dear life. <laughs> I'm holding on because I don't want to go up there. What's doing that? My flesh. My flesh don't want to go up there because if it does, a transformation is going to take place. Right? My mind is having a battle. Because the Spirit of God is just tugging on me. Like, you know, that's why I'm hanging on to that thing, white knuckles. And just, you know, and every, I, I can remember this just as clear as a bell. Every time somebody would step out into the aisle, I'd be like, ooh, because I really felt like I had to let go. Because that tug of the Holy Spirit was just drawing on me, you know, I'm like, no because then I can't think of whatever excuse, right? I can't do this, that, and the other thing. I can't be, you know, I can't run and play and do naughty things. Isn't it interesting that even in your unregenerated state, you know that? <laughs> so, so that intimacy that God's wanting to have with us comes by trusting him. So Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 says this, my child, when the Lord God speaks to you, never take his words lightly. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes we make as believers. God starts talking we're like, uh-huh. I'm watching a movie right now, God. Can we do this later? Or, or you're, you know, you're, you're on your way to the, to the grocery store and, and, you know, you got this 
you got these thoughts going through your brain about what you need to get. You know, I need to get this and that and the other thing. And, and, and God starts talking to you, and you're like, no, 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 not right now, God. I'm, I'm busy. I know you don't, I, I know you're thinking, I don't say that. But you do that. We do that. Let me say it that way. We do that. You start trying to be intimate with him, and we're like, not now. Not guys, how many of you have ever done this? Your wife starts talking to you, and you're watching the TV, and it's like Charlie Brown. You ever seen any of the Charlie Brown, you know, the teacher's talking, wah, 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 wah. You, that's all you hear, right? <laughs> you're not hearing English, you're just hearing me. And then, she, and then she'll get a little more forceful about it and say, you're not listening to me. And then you, huh? That's a funny way to start a conversation. <laughs> Right? <laughs> My child, when the Lord God speaks to you, never take his words lightly and never be upset when he corrects you. Ooh, we don't like those things. But listen, when God corrects us, have you ever noticed this? When God corrects you, when it's God, you never feel condemned. If you feel condemned, that's not God. There's more than one spirit in the world. Okay? God brings correction by gently moving us in his direction. Whenever, you see, the devil is always doing this. You ought to. You should have. Why didn't you? And there's always a condemning tone along with it. Where God's just trying to be intimate with us. You know, we're all adults in here. If you're trying to be intimate and you say something snappy, it kills the mood, doesn't it? (laughs) It's gone. Right? Some of you are like, I'm not sure. Come on now. We're all adults. (laughs) So... (laughs) So for the Father's discipline only comes from his passionate love and pleasure for you. So in other words, in that intimate moment when you're being close to God and he's talking to you and and he starts bringing correction to you, it's not going to kill the mood. It's going to draw you closer. Not push you away. You didn't do that right. Nope. He's going to say, let me show you something. He's going to try to, God's way is to woo. You know what it means to woo? Remember when, remember back in the dating days? You're always on, you know, you're almost always on your best behavior because you're trying to woo. You know what woo means? Woo woo, because you want to woo woo. <laughs> so you're... <laughs> So you're, so you're doing the woo things, right? And, and you're behaving, and you say nice.